Okay, so the step we're on now is what I call pre-dye finishing because it is the last step before you dye. And there is, well, usually comes between uh, carving and tooling and stamping and dyeing the leather. And this involves shaping, uh, this involves hole punching if necessary, and this involves finishing your edges. Everything that has to be done before you can let it dry, and everything that has to be done before you dye it. So, I now have all of my little pieces done. I have the main body of the bracer, and I have the little pieces that come off it, like so. And I have the connecting pieces there, and the straps will come off of those. Um, and I have this little piece, which uh, is involved when the straps make the intersection in the front. And the only other piece from this uh, heavy gold plate set is the buckle. If you're, if you're choosing to do your belt buckle out of uh, heavy leather, um, which I happen to have an extra one kicking around, uh, from the last time I made some, I just made an extra one. Um, so that one's already done. It's already dyed, actually, as well. Um, and you just cut out the shape uh, out of the heaviest leather you've got, because this does uh, need to be quite stiff, and bevel the top edge, but not the underside. And you don't even have to dye the underside, because you're going to be gluing stuff to this, and the glue will adhere better if there's no dye and no paint on it. But, for right now, the first step is to uh, bevel off the edges of everything. Um, so I've got an edge beveler here. This is a size 2, it's the smallest one Tandy sells. It is an itty bitty little uh, blade between these two tines that will just very neatly shave off the sharpest corner there. And this is not absolutely necessary. Uh, a deft hand with an uh, exacto knife or a utility knife combined with like sanding will kind of do the same thing, but it's really handy and it's not terribly expensive, probably only like seven bucks. So it is worth getting. And you do bevel both the top side and the underside. The reason I'm not beveling this portion is because it's not going to show. Uh, it gets layered underneath the other pieces. Because this is a blade, it will get dull eventually, and I have never had any luck sharpening them, although theoretically there's ways to do it. So I tend to treat them as disposable, even though I know I shouldn't. But when you notice that you're having to, to push a lot harder to really you know, put your shoulder into it in order to make the blade cut, um, and it's not cutting as cleanly, if it started um, dragging or getting a little bit jaggy, then uh, it's time to get a new blade. Technically this step can be done while the leather is dry. Um, so it is still a little bit damp right now. Uh, you can tell by the color that it's still a little bit dark. It hasn't uh, lightened up as much as it will when it's completely dry. Um, and you can use this tool on dry leather, but it cuts more cleanly and it lengthens the lifespan of your blade if you cut it while it's wet. Think of it like uh, hairdressers getting your hair wet before they cut it. It just makes everything a little bit more lubricated. It does have to be done while the piece is flat, though, because you really have to be pressing against a flat surface in order to use the beveling tool. So you have to finish your edges like this before uh, you do your shaping. And also before you do your dyeing, because if you dye it and then shave off the edges, uh, you're going to have a little piece of the undercolor of the leather. You're going to shave off the dyed part. And this little window I just cut with uh, a utility knife. Carefully. There is no secret to doing it, you just do it carefully. Now this is probably the driest piece of the bunch because it had to be out the longest while I was working on it. Um, so this color here is really close to what it's going to look like when it's completely dry.
if you do have to get your piece wet again, um, because if you're working slowly, if it's very dry where you are, there's a really good chance that this leather is going to dry out before you're done with your entire shoulder because it's a lot of work. Um, even me, who has done this many times before and knows to be going breakneck pace on this, uh, and knows how to go breakneck pace, it still uh, <laughs> dries out quite a lot. So if you have to re-wet it, um, do not soak it again. After you've done your cut lines, you should not be soaking it again. In fact, you shouldn't be moistening the leather from the top. Um, you should be applying water to the underside and letting it kind of soak up. So you would take a wet sponge or a wet paper towel or a wet regular towel and kind of uh, pat it onto the back and you'll see it soak it up. You'll see it change color and then put it back in a bag for a bit and give the water a chance to soak up from the underside. The thing is, uh, if your cut lines or if your stamps, so if the top grain of the leather uh, gets wet again after you've already worked with it, it's going to swell because it does act like a sponge, uh, veg gen leather does. It's gonna swell and you're gonna lose some of your really crisp textures. So for example, the stamping there, where it's not just uh, compressing the leather and making this beveling, it's also giving that stippled texture. Uh, there's a chance you would lose some of that. Your cut lines would uh, swell up a bit and they're kind of like... So right now we've got very crisp V-shaped cut lines. If it gets wet, they're kind of swell and kind of close um, and not be nearly as deep and vivid. So we don't want that. Okay, so all of the pieces have now been beveled. The next thing to do before we start shaping, uh, I always know this and I sometimes cut corners and skip it or leave it until later and I always wish I hadn't, is to mark where your holes are going to be because while your pattern piece is flat is the easiest time to mark those um, holes. After you bend things, it's not going to fit over it the same way because other changes shape like that. Okay, so this little piece, very simple. Just mark those three holes. And you can punch the holes out now if you want to, or you can leave it until later. The important part is just marking it so that you know where the holes are going to be. Actually, for these ones, you might want to go ahead and uh, punch it or you're likely to lose them. It's really easy to lose the holes in this textured backgrounding design. Twisting it like that makes it more likely to take the little piece of leather with it when you pull it off instead of leaving it stuck in there and then you have to like grab it all and shove it out. The bottom one only has the top three holes because there's nothing connecting to the bottom there. You can also do this step with a manual hole punch and a hammer and a cutting board so you would just line up your little thing correctly and with a cutting board underneath it because you will damage your marble and damage your tools if you don't um, set it up and punch your holes that way. It makes no difference whatsoever. Um, I'm using the hole puncher because it's a little bit faster. Uh, that one, a little bit faster. But if the hole is like in the middle of the piece, then obviously this guy can't reach it because it can only reach things that are a couple inches away from the edge. Okay, so when it's time to uh, shape these things to dry, it is often handy to use some rivets to hold them into the correct location or the correct shape. Um, because leather's a little bit stretchy at this stage, so if your holes don't quite line up, you can kind of make them line up um, with this. And I'm not going to put caps on it um, because I don't want the caps leaving an outline on the wet leather, which they will, because wet leather picks up indentations very easily. But I can do that, just make sure that they fit together properly. 
So you want to make sure this is a very smooth curve. Uh, sometimes when you're squeezing things with your fingertips, you can put a little finger indentation in it. And that is something that you want removed or smoothed out before you let it dry because otherwise that fingertip indentation is there to stay. The shape it dries in, it'll still be flexible when it dries, but that's the shape it's going to want to go back to. So uh, you always want to have it perfectly shaped before you let it dry. There's no adjusting it after it dries. Okay. So yeah, no need for caps. Uh, just stick the rivets through there and let it hold it in place while it dries. Okay. And there we go. That looks beautiful. That is exactly what it's supposed to do, so I will put that aside. Um, these guys, yeah, I'll punch the holes later. Or I might as well do it, right? <laughs> There's no point not doing it now. But yeah, that's what I mean about the little piece of leather getting stuck in there and you just have to poke it out the rest of the way. Okay. The final piece is the large one, which I've been putting off till last because I don't like it. Um, but yeah, this is the one that you really want to make sure you punch your holes on before you shape it, because otherwise it is a pain and a half. And if you buy my pattern, you will have a much nicer pattern that doesn't involve uh, these shenanigans. But the red marked holes are for the front, and the blue marked holes are for the back. They're very similar, but not quite the same. Um, the little bicep thing is actually angled a little bit forward because your arms tend to come forward more than they go back so it just makes sense to give you a little bit more leeway that direction. This is where that piece attaches and there is another small little strap that comes off there but we haven't cut it yet because we haven't worked on the straps yet. The straps are made of lighter leather and they're done very differently. So I do them as a whole set. I do this as a whole set because it's the same process on all the pieces. You know, casing, stamping and tooling, punching holes and shaping, and then letting it dry and black dyeing and gold painting. So this is, this all gets the same procedure. Okay, the next thing you have to do obviously is round this thing out, and I don't like this. Um, sometimes it helps to, you can start by rounding it over your knee. This is not going to get it all the way, and it's not going to get a very smooth, large curve. It can get a smooth, small curve. Uh, but just stretch it out as much as you can. This is the benefit of using leather over a lot of other different materials, because it can bend in three different dimensions. It doesn't just like bend one way or bend the other way, but not both. And I see leather sometimes where people have curved it, but not rounded it. And I really feel like they're not using the full potential of the leather. Uh, that That's one of the really cool things that leather can do. And if you're not doing that, you might as well be using something cheaper. All right, uh, the other thing I have is this bowl, which has a very, very rounded bottom. It's not like flat with a rim or anything and you can put it inside the bowl and be careful pushing down because if you push down and this is pressing into the edge there at a very sharp um, like a lot of pressure just on the rim it will leave indentations that you don't want so ugh, no me gusta I'm trying to get it in there without um, getting it on the edges. Okay, here we go. So, yeah. Get it in there and then start rounding it out. And this is not going to be your final shape. This is just to help you get that really dramatic uh, rounding on it. For things you do a lot, you might want to make custom molds. I have some wooden molds that I use for making bags because they are specifically in the shape they're um, 
that I'm turning the bag into. But um, shoemakers use this. It's how they get uh, like the. I think wing tips are like uh, men's dress shoes with the very molded leather tips. Okay, so I am. Obviously, that's not <laughs> the way I want the pauldron to look, but I'm pleased with that level of curve. So now I'm going to take it out and finish it off. All right. So yeah, this actually gets folded up. And if you can uh, stretch it outwards this direction, that looks very nice. Same as on the Loki shoulder. Uh, Loki shoulder gets a very similar sort of shaping where you bend it up and then kind of fold it outward. And this is the other thing that happens, that it tends to get ripply when you are trying to compress the, because you're actually trying to make this section larger and this section smaller. It doesn't quite work like that. Okay. So you're going to want to try to flatten that a little bit because this part where it comes off there is flat. And then smooth out the finger wrinkles there. And this feels very floppy right now. You can you can tell from watching the video that it's very floppy. That's okay. It's going to stiffen up as it dries, and then it's going to stiffen up even more as we put the um, black dye on it. Okay, so I am relatively happy with this. I think I'm used to working with a stiffer leather because I'm like, ugh, it's so floppy. Um, and I have a stand that I use for displaying pauldrons at Ren Fairs and conventions that I'm not sure where it is right now because I just moved. So I'm going to turn the camera off and see if I can go find that because that is what will hold this in the right position while it dries. So I'm not going to show the final step of, I mean, just fix it the way you want it to look when it dries, and then find a way to prop it up. If you don't have something with that kind of curve, you can uh, crumple up a bunch of newspaper into the right shape and have it hold it that way, or you can kind of sandwich it between two things that are kind of heavy, so sandwich it like that so that it holds that shape and dries into that shape. Okay. And then I will return when it's time for black dyeing because that's the next step for these guys.